The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to City Church. It's great to see all of you here in this room, those joining us online. As we come into worship this morning on the sixth Sunday of Easter, in which we will continue to focus on the resurrection of Jesus and what that means for us. Particularly, we are focusing on how the resurrection gives us a new way of seeing our lived reality as one that is continually cycling through death and rebirth. And so this morning, wherever you find yourself on that continuum, whether you find yourself in a period of loss, a period of grief, perhaps a period of change, or on the other hand, if you find yourself in a period of new life, of excitement, of rebirth, know that knowing where you are is you walking with Jesus, who lives your same life with you and who died and who rose again. So with that, please stand with me now for the call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Sing a new song to God who has worked wonders, whose right hand and holy arm have brought deliverance. God has made salvation known and shown divine justice for the nations. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout to the Most High, all the earth. Break into joyous songs of praise. Let the sea and all within it thunder, the world and all its peoples. Let the rivers clap their hands, and the hills ring out for joy before God, who comes to judge the earth, who will rule the world with justice and its peoples with equity. Amen. Holy Lord, we welcome you into this place now. Please be present with each of us. Please give us a new way of seeing. Please speak to our individual hearts wherever we are at this time as we sing to you now. Amen.
be seated. So here now our call to confession, which comes from Matthew 9. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And in thinking about confession today, I thought of the show Severance. Has anyone watched that? I'm not going to give any spoilers away if you haven't. Um, But if you have seen it, you'll remember the break room and what happens in the break room. And it made me think of that because I think sometimes 
when we come into confession, we can come in crying out for grace, but then we can engage in activity that you know, can feel like verbal self-flagellation. It can feel like trying to get ourselves into a state of feeling bad, of feeling guilty, even if we don't. It can be making a sacrifice of words. But Jesus says here, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Go and learn what that means. And for the practice of confession, I think part of what it means is that our practice needs to be grounded in compassion, with a a sense of grace and mercy and empathy for ourselves and those things that have led us into bad action, because this is what we need in order to actually change. And so with compassion towards ourselves and towards those who have harmed us, towards those we have harmed, towards the harm we have inflicted on ourselves, let's pray our prayer of confession together now. Together praying. Sorry, this is a call and response, so. You asked for faith and trust. We demanded proof and certainty. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Your love was stronger than death. We built tombs around our hearts. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You sent us into the world with a message of hope. We lingered in comfortable despair. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Take a moment now for silent confession. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So having received the peace of Christ, I'm going to invite you in a moment to stand and extend that peace to each other. You can say, the peace of Christ be with you, peace be with you, or however you are comfortable today saying hello. But first from me to you, the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. Greet each other with a sign of Christ's peace. Okay, so it is the time in our service now when we bless our children and our youth. Kids, it's so good to see those of you who are here today, 
Those of you who are joining us online, welcome. You are such an important part of this church, and it makes me so happy, and all of us happy to see you all here. Uh, today, children three years through third grade will be proceeding to the gym after the dismissal. Fourth and fifth grade also will be um, after the dismissal joining their teachers in classroom one. Uh, nursery care is open for younger kids. And if you're new here and you have any questions about any of this, ask uh, one of us, ask anyone holding the signs in the back there. But now together, let's bless our children and our youth. People of God, what is our prayer for these children and youth? May the Lord be with you. And kids, you say? And also with you. May God's love sustain you. May God's spirit empower you. And may God's joy fill your hearts. Amen. And we all say together, thanks be to God. And for those staying, you can remain standing as we sing. You may be seated. 
Well, good morning again, everyone. It's great to see you here today. Um, my name is Stephen Gunlock. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a pastor on staff here, and it's my pleasure to get to welcome you again to City Church this morning. At City Church, we believe the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross are a sign that the very love of God is reaching out to all of us. And to that end, we welcome all persons into our faith community, regardless of gender, race, age, physical or mental capacity, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, socioeconomic or marital status. All are welcome here. We have a few upcoming events um, that I want to point you towards now, not too many, um, but I'm going to point out a few announcements now. Uh, first up, in two weeks, we have a home gathering in the Portola, aka the Flower District of San Francisco, at the home of Thomas and Sophie Lee. I'm grateful for them, uh, to them for hosting this. We'll be having a backyard barbecue in their yard at their home down in that area. Uh, we'll be having more gatherings like this over the summer, so stay tuned for more things like this as we get past Memorial Day next weekend. Uh, but if you're new here, we especially invite you to this, so you'll want to check that out. Um, next, today, we are excited at the end of the service to give you an update on the search process for our next senior pastor, so you'll want to stay till the end of the service to get that update. Um, then finally tonight, there are youth CGs meeting from 5 to 7 here at the Russian Center. Um, but last but certainly not least, uh, today we are thrilled to welcome back the Dr. Reverend Paula Stone-Williams to our pulpit today. Uh, Paula, go ahead. welcome Paula. Uh, Paula, as many of you know, is a friend of City Church. Um, we're grateful to have her here today. Paula is an internationally known speaker on issues of gender equity, LGBTQ advocacy, and religious tolerance. She's been featured in TED Women, TED Summit, The New York Times, The Washington Post, scores of other media outlets. Uh, Paula's a keynote speaker at hundreds of corporations and conferences and uni universities around the world, and her TED Talks have had over 7 million views at this point, I believe. So um, oh, also, I highly recommend that you check out Paula's memoir, As a Woman, What I Learned About Power, Sex, and Patriarchy After I Transitioned. Uh, so we're really excited to have Paula here again today. And with that, we'll turn our attention now to the scripture reading. The scripture reading today is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. <clears throat> On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her hus household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. Take a moment now for silent reflection. So the last time I was here in March, I talked a little bit about one of the myths that we tell ourselves as humans. One of those myths is that we care more about the truth than we care about belonging. But the truth is we've always cared more about belonging than we care about the truth. I talked back in March about how I, as a pastoral counselor, 
have clients come to me who courageously are ready to confront their perpetrator, a member of their family. And they say to me, I know my family's going to back me up in this because they are aware of the abuse that took place. And I have to be the one to tell them that likely the family's not going to back them up because people, in fact, would rather belong to that dysfunctional family system than they would to courageously speak the truth. And I wish I were wrong most of the time, but I'm not. I'm usually right. Because the truth is, we humans care more about belonging than we do about the truth. But there's another myth that we tell ourselves, and that myth is that more than anything else, we want to be free. That freedom matters to us more than anything else. It's on the license plates in New Hampshire. Live free or die. And we all remember that iconic phrase from the movie Braveheart. They may take away our lives, but they will never take away our freedom. They don't have to take away our freedom because it's a myth that we want to be free. We give away our freedom. Did you know there are only three moral standards for our species? Only three through the history of time. All of us hold to one of three basic moral foundations or standards. The first and oldest moral standard is that there is no greater good than to protect the integrity of the tribe that there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. This is the oldest of the three moral standards because we as a species never took off until we moved from the level of blood kin to the level of tribe. That's when civilizations developed. That's when possibilities of language began to develop, when we moved from being blood kin in our orientation to being tribal in our orientation. And in so doing, we decided there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe, which means we were more than willing to give away our freedom to the leaders of the tribe for the integrity of the tribe. It is still the primary moral standard of much of the continent of Africa and other developing nations. The first and oldest moral standard that there's no greater good than protecting the integrity of the tribe. There's a second moral standard. This one has no geographical boundaries. The second moral standard is that there's no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods. And this is the moral standard of all forms of fundamentalism, wherever you find it in the world, particularly among the fundamentalist forms of the desert religions. There are three desert religions, Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. They all began in the desert, therefore they all began as religions of scarcity. There's not many resources to go around in the desert, and so I've got to take care of me and mine. There were those who were in and those who were out, those who were good and those who were bad. Now you contrast that with, let's say, Native American religions or Pacific Islander religions and you see a massive difference because the others are religions of abundance, because they developed in places of abundance. But the desert religions began as religions of scarcity. And therefore, you had to appease an angry God. Now, fortunately, in their more generous forms, all three are no longer religions of scarcity, but in their fundamentalist forms, all three remain religions of scarcity. In the Middle East, that's Islam. In the United States, it's fundamentalist and evangelical Christianity. And there's no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods, even to force upon the rest of a culture the teachings of those gods, which is what we see happening politically in the United States today. But there is a third moral standard. It's actually the smallest of the three, followed by the fewest people of the three which is hard for us to understand because it's the moral standard of secular America. And what is this third moral standard? That there's no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual. This is, in fact, the profound secular moral standard on which our entire nation is established. It's quite clearly the moral standard on the East Coast and on the West Coast. It's the moral standard in Western Europe, in Scandinavia, in Australia, New Zealand, 
It is, in fact, the moral standard under which most of us grew up, that there's no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual. And where does that moral standard come from? Ultimately, Christianity. Because every one of those nations holding to that moral standard began as Christian nations. It goes back to the teachings of Jesus in the 8th chapter of John when Jesus says, I will make you free, and if I make you free, you will be free indeed. And as Paul took the gospel into Europe, to Galatia, what's now Turkey, into Greece, what then was the city of Philippi, the city of Thessalonica, off the Aegean Sea. When Paul took the message of the gospel there, more than anything else, he wanted it to be a message of freedom. That's why he became so angry when the Galatian Christians who were Jews coming from the Roman Empire came with the rules and regulations of Judaism with them and told the new Celtic Christians from northern Galatia that they had to be followers of the Jewish law as well as followers of the teachings of Jesus. That's why Paul wrote his letter to the church at Galatia to say that is not the case because he knew northern Galatia, he knew what is now modern-day Greece, were peopled by Celtic people. The Celtic people came from Central Europe, moved to Western Europe, permeated all of continental Europe and the British Isles, but the Romans saw them as barbarians and drove them out of continental Europe, so the only place their culture survived with great strength was the British Isles. But interestingly, what marked these people more than anything else was their love of freedom. And it was, in fact, that form of Christianity, Celtic Christianity, which took root here in the United States, where the major focus was freedom. No wonder this perspective appealed to the woman named Lydia. She was not a conventional woman of the age. She worked outside the home. She was an entrepreneur. She manufactured and sold goods, purple dye, purple cloth, to the higher end of the financial world. She became quite wealthy, had a large home, and then also being un unconventional, she freely chose a new religion, a religion focused on the person of Jesus, a religion focused on freedom. And not only did she become a part of that religion, she encouraged her household to do so, and then she bankrolled the work of Paul and the other three apostles who were with him. In fact, she and three other women bankrolled pretty much all of the work he did throughout what is now modern-day Greece. She understood that there is nothing more important than living authentically, that the call toward authenticity is sacred and holy and for the greater good. Do you know we are all spiritual beings? Every single human being is spiritual. It's just that our spirituality does not get as much attention as the other parts of our lives. What gets most attention is our ego. Because our ego has just two desires, power and safety. The ego reigns in most all of our lives because we all want power and we all want safety. But as we grow and mature, we're often able to break beneath the level of ego to the level of soul. Occasionally, the soul will bubble up through the bedrock harshness of our egos, the ego that demands power, that demands safety. The soul bubbles up through it, and the soul is not interested in power and safety. The soul is interested in the ride. The soul is interested in the journey. And so we create opportunities for the soul to slip forth through the bedrock harshness of things. And there are, in fact, six stages of spiritual development. The first three do not get beyond the stage of the ego. The first two are the magical stages of spirituality we have in childhood. Initially, it's mom and dad who were all powerful, all controlling. And once we realize they're not, we move to stage two where it's superheroes who are all powerful and all controlling. But then we come into the first adulthood our adolescence, our 20s, 30s, when the vast majority of us move to stage three of spiritual development, which is in fact traditional religion. 
we accept whatever religion has been handed to us. But that religion at this stage is almost always a religion of rules and regulations. It is a religion based usually in the desert religions and their very angry God who kept resources to himself and did not spread resources to everyone to a God who demanded fealty, to a God who said, you must obey my rules and regulations or I will send you to hell, to a religion focused on blood sacrifice. This is, in fact, traditional fundamentalism, traditional fundamentalist Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. But we come to the point in life where that's no longer working for us. We get to the point when we're not looking for rules and regulations and we have a difficult time accepting the notion of a God who basically hates us as we are and demands that we change tremendously before he might reluctantly allow us into his very restrictive heaven because we become parents and we know we would never treat our own children that way. That we love our children no matter what even though they are often not real lovable. And we begin to question and doubt this third type of spirituality, this third stage where we have been taught that an angry God demands that we follow that God before we will be allowed reluctantly by that God into heaven and we come into stage four of spiritual development which is in fact hell. That's right. Stage four of our spiritual development is hell. At least that's how Dante defined it. Because at the beginning of the Divine Comedy, he said, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. This is the fourth stage of spiritual development. It's what Shakespeare has Macbeth saying. Life is but a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This is the delightful part of stage four of our spiritual development. We begin to question absolutely everything. It's what John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. It's what Joseph Campbell in the hero's journey calls the road of trials that leads straight into the deep, dark, black cave where the true way is wholly lost. It is in fact a period of great spiritual disillusionment and disenchantment. It is in fact learning that doubting everything is the beginning of wisdom. That's right. Doubting everything is the beginning of wisdom. This is the stage at which we discover the truth will set you free, but it is guaranteed to make you miserable first. So my son and I have the great privilege of being what's called speaker's ambassadors for TED. And so just last month, we were in Vancouver at their major event where both Jonathan and I were working with several different speakers, getting them ready for their TED talk, which is a delightful experience, but one of the speakers with whom I was working came to me and said, you know, they had all of us watch a couple of your TED Talks. And one of the TED Talks they had us watch in preparation for our own was the TED Talk you did with your son. And the speaker said, and you are a pastor, correct? I said, yes. And he said, well then, I kind of want to quote one of your lines word for word from that talk you did with your son. You said in that talk, I believe in God most days, except for Tuesdays and Thursdays, and any day I'm on the New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> he said, how could you as a pastor say that? I said, have you ever driven on the New Jersey Turnpike? <laughs> I said, oh my, how could I not? say that. Have you seen what's happening in Ukraine? Do you know what's happening to democracy all over the Western world? Do you see what's happening in our nation to trans kids? How could you not question, is anybody in charge of all this? How could you not question the very existence of God? This is stage four of spiritual development and it's terrifying. 
It's the point at which you question absolutely everything. And for a lot of people, it's too much, far too much. And so what do they do? One of two things. They either rush back to stage three, where they go back to the religion in which they were raised, and now those people are very happy to have them back. They have them give testimonies about how they wandered away from God, but now they've returned to God as backsliders made good. And what, of course, we don't realize is that that is, in fact, the failure of nerve. It was the failure of their own courage that took them back to stage three. That's what some people do. But the majority of people in today's America just ignore stage four. In fact, they ignore their soul. They allow their ego to call all the shots. They no longer exercise their spiritual muscles. And they become truncated in their spiritual development. Their souls remain immature, stuck in stage four. We all know many friends who were stuck there. The effort doesn't seem to be worth it. But it is worth it. Because if you make it through stage four, you come into stage five of spiritual development where ironically, most of the time, you end up returning to the religion in which you were raised in just a very different way. No longer is it a religion of rules and regulations, but now it's a religion focused on love. It's a religion that is broad and deep. It's a big tent. It's this church. A church of people in stages four and five. It's the church I lead in Boulder County, Colorado. A church filled with people who are questioning and wondering and trying to allow their soul to slip forth. And those who are struggling and yet return to a very clear focus on the person of Jesus. That is the focal point of this church. That is the focal point of my faith. It is the person of Jesus. But you welcome in others from other backgrounds. You encourage them to join you as we search for meaning together, as long as they understand that we are, in fact, a Christian church. Only it's not a stage three spirituality. It's not rules and regulations. It is, in fact, a more mystical faith. It is a mi more mysterious faith. It's not a faith interested in giving you answers. It's a faith interested in asking the right questions. When we get to stage five, we find we have fewer friends but deeper friendships. We no longer look outside ourselves for our sense of purpose, but we look deep inside our own soul. And in this stage, we realize when we have been called, we must answer that call, often onto the hero's journey. Now, there is a stage six, but my experience is not many folks get there. Pretty much can guarantee you I'm not going to get there. Who gets to stage six? You know, Mother Teresa, you know, Gandhi, or possibly one of my favorites from the 1950s, the great Secretary General of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, who wrote shortly before his untimely death, he had a premonition about his coming death, and he wrote these words, for all that has been thanks, for all that shall be yes. He wrote, night is drawing nigh for all that has been thanks, for all that shall be yes. Okay, when you get to the point you can say that, now maybe you're at stage six of spiritual development. Most of us end up staying in stage five of spiritual development. And of course, Jesus shows us how to get from three to six. He always showed how to get from three to six. It's the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. The disciples are stuck in stage three of spiritual development. They want Jesus to be the new political king of Israel. They want him to defeat all of their enemies, bring independence back to their people, and give them power and free food. They're working from the level of ego. And Jesus says to them, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And then he says he's coming back, but he says it in a way that's so confusing they don't understand a thing at all. He says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. When I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again that where I am you may be also, and you know the way where I'm going. Huh? They have no idea what he's talking about. He's talking about leaving and coming back in the form of the Holy Spirit, not exactly a well-understood concept. 
but only one of the disciples has the guts to admit it because he's the only one initially willing to go into stage four of disillusionment. It's Thomas, and he says, we don't know what you're talking about. How would we know the way? And Jesus gives him the gold. I am the way, the truth, the life. You want to know what's true? Look at me. You want to know what it means to be fully, truly free? Look at me. Live like I live. Do what I do. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then Jesus does it again, this time without words. It's the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. He's been taken captive by the Jewish authorities. They have decided he's deserving of death, and he's taken before the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate, not a happy man. He thought that maybe his political patronage would give him a really, really neat ambassadorship in one of those cool nations, but no, he ends up in Palestine, where all the Jewish people of Israel can't get along with each other, and now they've brought to him yet one more Messiah claiming to be the Messiah, and it's the last thing he wants to deal with. And he says to the Jewish leaders, oh, deal with this guy yourself. And they say, oh, but this is a really bad one. He needs to be executed. And you, as Romans, have not given us the power to do that. And so he says, fine, bring him into my palace. That's exactly what happens. And my scripture is gone. I found it. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Was that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? You can see Pilate Greek. I've got a live one this time. Oh, I ask a simple yes or no question. Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Oh, so you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me and Pilate, exasperated not just by Jesus, but by every one of these people, says, what is the truth? And Jesus just stands there. And stands there. And silently stands there. And Pilate becomes so uncomfortable, he leaves the room and goes to talk to other people, while all those who remain see Jesus just standing there. The truth in the flesh. And every one of them were taken back to that moment just a few weeks earlier, when Jesus had once again been before a hostile crowd. It was his last public press conference, the last time he would ever meet with the crowds at large, and they were all trying to trap him, to send him to his death. And the final public question he was ever asked was a very simple one. Which of the laws is the greatest? There were 613 of them. Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. His last public answer to his last public question. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love your own self. There was no, no, no question about his answer. It was exactly what they expected. They began every one of their religious services quoting those two laws. The problem is what Jesus said next. Because what Jesus said next was, on this are all the law and the prophets based. 
Now, they'd spent their entire lives studying the 613 laws of the Hebrew Scriptures. That wasn't enough for them. They'd written more. They had turned all of religion into rules and regulations, which if you follow them, will cause a very reluctant God to allow you into heaven. And Jesus comes along and says, No! It's just three things. Loving God, loving neighbor, and the hardest of all, loving your own self, allowing your soul to win over your ego, seeking power and safety, loving yourself. And Matthew tells us there was dead silence. Dead silence. And Jesus just stood there. And stood there. And stood there. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The truth was in the person of Jesus. The truth that sets you free is incredibly simple. Loving God, loving neighbor, and loving self. Incredibly simple, but not easy. The words of Mary Oliver, sweet Jesus talking his melancholy madness stood up in the boat and the sea lay down silky and sorry. So everybody lived that night, but you know how it is when something different crosses the threshold. The uncles mutter together. The women walk away. The young brother begins to sharpen his knife. Nobody knows what the soul is. It comes and goes like the wind over the water. Sometimes for days you don't think of it. Maybe after the storm, after the multitude was fed, one or two of the disciples felt the soul slip forth like a tremor of pure sunlight before exhaustion that wants to follow everything, swallow everything. Forgetting how the wind tore at the sails before he rose and spoke to it. Tender, luminous, demanding. As he always was, a thousand times more frightening than the killer sea. Forgetting how terrified they were before he rose and spoke to the wind and settled it. Tender, luminous, demanding, as he always was as he always is. It is the simplest message on earth to love God, love neighbor, and love self. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. God, thank you for showing us how. How to go through stages of disenchantment until our faith is re-enchanted. To go through periods of disillusionment, to stay through the dark night of the soul, to be willing to go into the place called lost, because lost is a place to thank you for giving us the courage to move beneath the level of ego to the level of soul, and now teach us, God, to love you. Teach us to love our neighbors, particularly the ones that don't look like us. And God, we know we won't be able to do the first two if we can't do the third. The hardest work of all. Teach us to love ourselves. For this is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Paula. We come now to the uh, offering time in our service. Uh, today, as we say every week, we're so grateful to everyone here online, um, around the country, who generously support the work of this church. If City Church is a blessing, a nourishment to your life, we invite you into the joy of giving. Uh, you can give online, you can text the number on the screen, you can download the City Church app. Uh, but now let's pray together the offering prayer. Together praying. God of all peoples and God of all places, we present these offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating reign in San Francisco throughout the world. 
With them, we also offer our time, our abilities, and our varied ministries, that each of us may be a part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen. So we come now to the celebration of Holy Communion, and as we say each week, I, I invite you to participate as fully as you are comfortable with today, whether you are here in this room or joining us online, regardless of where you are physically today, or in your own spiritual walk or perspective, whatever stage you're at, know that as we say each week, Jesus invites everyone to this table. So please make this a sacred time for yourself, 
knowing that in this meal, we participate spiritually with Christ in the meeting place of God and humanity. And in so doing, we receive through our senses a tangible expression of Christ's life in us. We'll begin, though, by saying the Apostles' Creed together. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. To give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, Lord God, for revealing yourself to us in Jesus. As we follow in his way, help us to tap into the well of your presence that is always available. Help us to ground ourselves in the gift of your holiness in which we live and breathe and move. Like the saints who have gone before us, plant us with ancient roots that go deep into eternity and that can sustain us in difficult times. Deliver us from fear and hatred and instead help us to ground so deeply in you that we begin to heal those damaged and broken parts of ourselves. Transform our darkness into light. Ground us in the path of wholeness with all the saints from every age in the angels who we join in a hymn of never-ending praise together singing. God most high, you sent your son Jesus as as a prophet and a promise to give knowledge of sin and salvation, to show the way of becoming free. Through him you sowed the seeds of our own transformation when he died, was buried in the earth, and was raised on the third day. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Now you invite us to participate in this same mystery through these elements derived from the same earth in which Christ was buried and raised. Send now your Holy Spirit that the bread we break and the wine we drink may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Continue the work you have begun in us. Make us people of tenderness and mercy who show power through weakness, authority through grace, and triumph through sacrifice. To you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and having given thanks, he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. A few words of instruction, which I have on my phone that I want to check. That First off, uh, would those assisting in communion come forward at this time? It's nice to be able to say that again. It's been a while. If there is anyone, please come forward at this time. <laughs> Thank you. At City Church, we participate by coming forward Uh, One row at a time through the middle aisle. You can take elements um, at each station and then proceed back to your seats via the outside aisles. We'll be taking communion by intinction today, which is the method where you take a piece of the bread and you dip it in the cup and then partake uh, at the station. 
know that if you cannot have wine, that taking the bread alone has always been a full participant and a full participant participation in the sacrament. And also we do have uh, communion kits on either side of the room for those who would feel more comfortable with those. For those of you at home, I invite you to go and gather your elements now. The gifts of God for the people of God, come and receive them with gladness. Please join me now in the communion prayer. Together praying, we thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all people. Amen. We'll continue now praying for the needs of the world. We praise and thank you, O Lord, for feeding us at your table. Grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints, we offer to you our prayers. Ruler of nations, today we pray for justice and peace for all people and in all places, but particularly those being targeted by more powerful nations or more powerful groups within nations. 
We pray for Ukraine as they continue to push back an unjust invasion. We pray for protection for the Ukrainian people, especially children in this ongoing conflict. Likewise, we pray for the victims of gun violence in this country, and particularly those killed, injured, and their families last weekend in Buffalo, New York. We pray against the sin of racism and white supremacy that has so infected our country and the culture of violence that has become the norm. We pray for all those who are afraid right now as they fear for their own life and bodily autonomy due to racist, racist attacks, leaked draft Supreme Court rulings, or the myriad of bills being passed in many states. We pray for true peace, for true, true protection, for true understanding across difference, for wise laws that protect the innocent, that can navigate ethical complexity without either or thinking, and that protect the bodily autonomy of women and LGBTQ plus people. In this city and in this church, help us to be a place where all people are able to find freedom from all the religious and cultural forces that may have previous, previously bound them, tied them in knots of shame, or told them that more powerful groups or people know what God thinks. Help us to know that our bodies belong not to the church or to the state, but to our own deepest nature, which is grounded in you. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to us now. Keep our hearts and thoughts always centered on Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand now as we sing our final song.
a lot more clapping here today than usual, which I like. Um, before the, well, you can be seated. Before the benediction, uh, we have an update from our pastoral search committee and our elder board. So uh, I'm going to invite Sarah, Kenny, and Lucia up now to give that update, and then they'll do the benediction. Good morning. All right. Um, okay. Well, about uh, nine, ten months ago, you might remember that uh, the three of us, along with John Dahl, uh, stood up here uh, in front of the church and um, let you guys know that we were beginning the search for a new senior pastor to succeed Fred. Um, the board assembled a committee uh, that was led by Sarah Dahl, and um, this committee was drawn from various reaches of the congregation. Uh, we really tried to include uh, all the various middle, the left, the right, the edges. The, you know, we try to really make sure there's really comprised and truly represented our congregation. Um, and so we have been kind of going through that process. We've worked long through the fall, the winter, and the spring through COVID. I mean, it's been, it's been a lot. Um, but the committee's job has been primarily to source, to interview, and to evaluate all of our candidates and to find the person that we uh, not only from a on paper standpoint and from interviews, but that we also feel, felt the spirit was leading us uh, to, uh, to be our next pastor. Now, just as a reminder, we are, because our, the RCA, the way our denomination works, is that the ultimately, uh, even though that committee is doing their thing to really source, ultimately it's the elder board, um, who there's a number of us here today. Um, it's our responsibility to make sure that uh, we fully understand the process, do some interviewing on our own, and also take that recommendation from, that, from the committee and then uh, kind of deliberate and pray on it. And, um, and then hopefully ultimately extend an offer. So as we worked, um, we know everybody's been patiently waiting. We've had lots of questions, uh, and we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for your support uh, and your encouragement uh, throughout all this process. And this morning, we are delighted to announce that that work is finally done. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I know we can do it. Okay, there we go. I like that. I love the excitement today. Um, so uh, we've offered um, this job and really feel that uh, Reverend, em Reverend Emily McKinley is um, going to be our next senior pastor. She feels very called to be here. Um, so yeah, let me, hopefully you can see your picture up there. And so uh, yeah, I'm going to turn this over to Sarah. All right. Um, well, so Emily comes to us from um, Urban Village Church in Chicago. So she's actually originally from the West Coast and is excited to move back out to the West Coast from Chicago. Um, she's currently serving there as their executive pastor and was previously a church planter, a site planter um, for their site in Woodlawn, which is Hyde Park on the south side of Chicago. Um, our entire search committee and the elder board are thrilled to have found her. Um, other search committee people are here this morning. Raise your hands, folks. These guys have done some amazing, amazing work over the last nine months, and um, we're just so delighted. Um, we really believe that God has been at work in this process, that this really has been providential. It really has been um, the spirit leading us to Emily and leading Emily to us. She is an exceptional leader and pastor. Um, we really believe she has the gifts that our church needs as we move into our next phase of life together. Um, when you go home today, um, we're sending out an email to everyone. So uh, folks who are online, you guys will get that too, um, saying a little bit more about this. And there will be a landing site that you can click through where there's more information about the process and the recommendation letter that our committee sent to the elder board recommending Emily so you can kind of read more and get to know more. Um, and we're also going to have a member meeting where we'll like dig into this in more depth um, on June 5th. Um, so I won't, I won't say too much now, but just by way of sort of a brief introduction to Emily, I do want to say that um, our board, or our committee and the board, were guided all along by three outcomes um, that really you as a congregation, we as a congregation, um, had communicated to the elder board that we needed. 
Uh, we wanted someone who would inspire City Church with a Jesus-centered vision of discipleship, inclusion, and service. We wanted someone who would cultivate a culture of belonging where everyone could feel welcome and belong. And we wanted someone who can lead our wonderful staff with health and grace and empower them to do their work. And, oh my gosh, my daughter's calling me. <laughs> so, sorry about that. I'm going to hang up on her. Um, <laughs> um, and I just want to say I, on all three of those points, we really believe that Emily is the person to do that job. And you can sort of read more and um, see more about that. And, the, and we'll talk a lot more about it when we have a member meeting, too, on the 5th. So normally, of course, we would make this announcement at a member meeting um, with Fred and the entire elder board here. But we didn't want to sit on it any longer than we needed to. We have sent her the offer letter. We've negotiated it. She has accepted. Um, we, didn't, we wanted to be transparent and um, let everyone know. She, Emily is telling her congregation today. And so... We felt that it was important to share it with our congregation as well. Um, so even though Fred's not here he is, and is in Mexico, he is super excited, and um, he wanted to share a few words with you as well. Hi, friends. Sorry I can't be with you in person today, but as most of you know, I'm on vacation. But I'll be back next Sunday. And it's been a season of waiting and trusting for me, as I have rightly not been a part of their process. But this search team, led by Sarah Dahl, I mean, what a group of stellar human beings. And they have found our next senior pastor, and I couldn't be more excited. When the team informed me that this was who they landed on, I had two questions. Was this unanimous? And they said, yes. And I said, are you unanimously enthusiastic? And they said, yes. And I said, well, that's the gold standard for search teams in church world. And after spending time with Emily, I knew she would be a great fit for us going forward. Emily's experience in church planting and senior leadership, Sarah already sang all her praises, but as I was telling Laura Turner, who's also a search team member over lunch recently, Torelli and I have prayed for many years that I would feel this way, that we would feel this way about my successor. And I'm thrilled and overjoyed that you all have found someone like Emily McGinley. I can't wait for you to meet her in person, but here's the next best thing. Hello friends and greetings from Chicago. I am so excited to meet you this morning. Even though I can't see you, I've had an opportunity to meet with several different um, uh, folks from City Church that the search team um, brought together for me to be in conversation with. And if those folks are any indication of the kind of people that make up uh, the broader community, um, I know that there is so much possibility about what God can do, uh, not only uh, among the community to grow the community, both in faith as well as connection to one another, um, but even more what God can do through the community to be a presence of life, of joy, of grace in the city of San Francisco. I am really excited to come alongside you to serve with you, um, to discern, discover, and move into what it is that the Spirit is uh, leading um, City Church toward, and to work alongside just the incredible um, staff, pastors, um, uh, elders, um, and other leadership of the church who help us, uh, help you all to um, be who you are and do what you do with such grace um, and commitment. And and so uh, between now and then, uh, when I come and join you um, in the late summer, early fall, I will be praying for you. And I hope that you will be praying for me and my family too as we make this transition to City Church. Um, I am uh, just delighted to be able to serve with you. And I know that the Spirit is ready to do beautiful things um, through us together as we um, incline our hearts and minds toward where God is leading us. Peace to you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Um, you guys don't even know how excited I'm about this. This is, she's amazing. So I'm so excited for y'all to get to meet her and meet her and talk to her. So, um, but thank you so much for staying a little bit extra today. Um, just uh, hearing us out in this important announcement. Um, and as Sarah said, we will have a member meeting on June 5th. So immediately after the service, uh, anyone who's interested in learning more, have questions, want to talk to us. Uh, please stay on that day. Uh, we didn't have it next week because it's Memorial Day weekend and we want to make sure to have as many people here as possible. And then Fred will be back by then also. So if you have any questions for him. Um, 
and we are staying today after if you have any immediate questions right now. So um, us, search committee elders, uh, feel free to come um, reach out to us. And do look for that um, website landing page um, about her. So we'll have a little bit of bio and kind of a letter from her, a recommendation letter, um, get to know a little bit more about the search process and such. Um, but now, um, I'll oh, let us go for today. Um, so do the benediction. May the living God lift the shroud that lies upon our world. May the risen Savior remove the sting of death, bringing all to life in him. May the flowing spirit set us in all creation free and seal our hearts with faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the creator, Christ, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks. Thanks Thank you all.